All right. And we are back. Welcome to the Biblos Network. We're so glad that you can join us. I pray that your day has been blessed, that your week has been filled with the Spirit of God. There are wonderful things happening here at First Pentecostal Church in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, we just came out of a wonderful prayer meeting. There's a spirit of prayer that has swept over the church. We've recently uh, returned from the Little Rock Camp Meeting, um, international camp meeting, and what a time we had. If you missed that, go online, check it out. It won't be the same, but you'll get the gist of it. Um, and if you were there, you know. It was on earth as it is in heaven. And such powerful messages, such revelation, and what an anointing, what a power of God filled that place. I'm so thankful. I'm thankful to be part of the church. I'm thankful to, to have the testimony of Jesus Christ in 2021. Um, we have some good stuff for you this week. We're excited to bring some things to you. Um, we've had a lot of feedback from people. They have texted, they've emailed, they've commented, and we want to talk a little bit about that. Um, probably one of the most requested topics we get is the oneness of God. And as apostolic believers, we, we have endured a lot in the realm of the oneness of God. Uh, the Trinitarian world has has had a lot of influence over the last 2,000 years. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I make the strong contention that the Trinitarian view um, is an error in that the word persons does violence to the essential oneness of God's nature. It didn't originally mean persons as distinct individuals with distinct minds but it originally meant persona, which was a theater term. And it meant a mask that one actor wears. And so what started out as a good intention and a, and a way for, <clears throat> for Tertullian to describe the one God and the roles that he played morphed into and was perverted into three distinct people over time. So I want to call this the oneness of God dialoguing with the Trinitarian. And I actually want to, I want to address uh, some questions that have been directed to us because they're good questions. And these questions actually come from Cody Anderson. Cody, we got your comments on the channel and we're thankful you took the time to, to respond. You did it in a, in a spirit of grace and class. Thank you for, uh, not wanting to be contentious because contention does not help. And, and a sincere seeker of truth doesn't have to lower themselves to, to fighting and squabbling about um, the, the dynamics of the nature of God. That, that battle has been going on for 2,000 years, and it has literally killed people. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we don't subscribe to the, the ideologies of John Calvin and Calvinism uh, first of all, you know, there's a lot of theological reasons, but there are practical reasons. One of them is John Calvin burned Michael Servetus at the stake. He murdered him, and, and he did it in the name of God. And so the Calvinistic ideologies of today, um, you know, maybe we'll explore those. We've had some questions. People want us to talk about that and the apostolic stance towards Calvinism. And we will. We'll do that. I look forward to that session. But... But there has been a lot of aggression towards oneness people. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And, and we're specifically, specifically going to address questions. So Cody asked these questions, and we're going to respond to him. And Cody, if you're listening, again, thank you. We're glad that you tuned in. And anybody else, any of our Trinitarian friends that are out there, we want to dialogue with you. It is time to come to the table. Let there be a meeting of the minds. And, and if you have a response to this, then I'm happy to, to enter into a dialogue with you. And anybody that is wrestling with the, the, Trinitary, the Trinity or the oneness, the essential oneness of God. So the first question here, <clears throat> he asks, being that the, Trini the Unitarian, he calls it the Unitarian view, and he asks, is that the right term? Well, we wouldn't classify ourselves as Unitarians. Some have in history been labeled that, but the, the, the term that we usually go by is oneness. 
the oneness believers or the oneness of God, oneness people. There are Unitarian people that believe um, differently, radically differently than we do. So they do have a Unitarian view of God, but we would not be considered that. We do not view ourselves in that way. So the correct term would be oneness. We are oneness believers. Um, he says, I don't understand all the scriptures that talk about Jesus being with the Father or the Word with the Word, Jesus being sent, going back to, ascending to. So those are spatial words that seem to imply that Jesus is going from you know, to God, from coming from God. You know, there's places where he is sent into the world, given, or the Father giving to Jesus, Jesus being shown things by the Father. And so he says these verses indicate that there's an interaction taking place, which only occurs between at least two individuals, meaning that there's a relationship going on. So he talks about this relationship, and, and then he finally winds that up by saying, if you ignore all this dialogue by saying there's only one person involved the whole time, I would say that you're in denial of the New Testament text. Okay, so how can there be dialogue between Jesus and the Father, the Son and the Father? How can there be that dialogue? How could Jesus <clears throat> be sent from or come to? Um, how it, it seems like there's a relationship happening here. So you can take that a little further. How can Jesus have a conversation with the Father? Um, how can he pray to him in the garden? How could he call out to him on the cross? These are all different ways of asking the same thing. How can there be interaction between one person if they're just one person? <clears throat> so that's a great question. It is a very common question that oneness people are asked. And so we're going to take the time to talk about that. So interaction between the Son and the Father, how does that work? Well, whenever you see what looks like a distinction, a separation between the Father and the Son, there are some parameters that you need to establish. Here's the first thing that you need to establish. The early church would have had no trouble with this teaching and with this uh, understanding because the Trinity did not exist until... Um, the second century, um, uh, over a hundred years after the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection, <clears throat> the word wasn't coined until much, much later, more than a century later. And so they never viewed God in a, in, in the context of three, that's something that was added a couple hundred years later. Now that is not a oneness position or a Trinitarian position. That is history. You can read about it. It's very easy to, to, to run it down. Those original texts, Tertullian coins the term. Um, the term Trinitas emerges. Um, God in tres persone, God in three persons. The original church did not have that framework. Now, for 2,000 years, we have been indoctrinated by it. We have been um, much of Catholic ideology, which is what that is, was passed down and given to people. <clears throat> and, and here's how insidious that is, and here's how dangerous that is. When the Catholic Church, um, like Ignatius Loyola, when he, the, the father of the Jesuits, when he began to push the Catholic dogma and the ideologies of the Catholic Church, not only did they promote it and write about it, but they burned any dissenting opinion. They killed people, they martyred people, they, they confiscated materials, they burned all records, and, and that was in an effort to do the holy work of God. And so the Baptist church, the Methodist church, all the denominal churches, they come from that heritage. So the Trinity is a Catholic thing that infiltrated Protestantism through, through the ages. So for 2,000 years, we've had this paradigm, this flawed assumption that the original church, Peter, James, John, the people who actually wrote the Bible, you know, for such an important word, for such an important concept, you would think God would have included it in his word. And, and he didn't. And the reason he didn't is because it doesn't belong in his word. And so we don't get smarter the further we get from Jesus. 
we have to go back to Jesus in the original apostles, and that is where we find our truth. So having said that, you have to realize that we've had 2,000 years of indoctrination that people have looked at this through the lens or the paradigm of three persons. That did not exist in that early church. So the right way is to view it through the Mark 12, 28 to 32 paradigm, which is the greatest commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So we view it through a lens of oneness. That is our default position. That was the apostles' default position, and that was what Jesus taught. It is the greatest commandment in the Bible. Uh, The entire law and prophets hang upon that. So that's the first thing I'm going to say. The second thing I'm going to say is whenever you're looking at a dialogue, instead of looking at it as two divine persons having a conversation, view it as the Spirit of God and the flesh of God interacting. And we know that there's a difference between that divine will of God and the man Christ Jesus. It's very easily seen. There is a distinction. We, we know there's a distinction. Um, so Jesus prays in the garden, you know, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So there's a dialogue. The question is, is it two divine persons having a disagreement Is it one divine will having to submit itself to a primary divine will? Or is it a human? It's a man. Jesus was an authentic man. So whenever you see dialogue between the man Christ Jesus and the Spirit of God, it's not two divine persons arguing or having to come to an agreement. It is the man Christ Jesus submitting his his true, authentic human self to the Spirit of God. And there is interaction there. There is a distinction there, but it's not a distinction of two divine persons. It is a distinction of spirit and flesh. Now, how to describe that and and to intricately tell you how that works, I don't know. Jesus was a man unlike any other man. There is a mystery of godliness But the mystery is not how two divine or three divine people can exist together, but the mystery is how that the Spirit of God and the man Christ Jesus interact and how they come together as that one God. So when he prays, if Jesus the Son prays to the Father and they are two separate divine persons, now that's a big problem. If they're two divine people, That's a huge problem because that means that divine person two is now praying to divine person one. And by by its very nature, that can't be possible. He, He says on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So does the second divine person who is supposed to be co-eternal, co-essential, um, Is that second divine person calling the first divine divine person God? Are you my God? Well, that's that's not what that means, and that's a big problem if you interpret it that way. Um, It is the man Christ Jesus who is a true human who is submitting his human nature and human self to the Spirit of God. That is the interaction you're seeing there. It was real humanity. He had a real human spirit. He had a real human will. And that will was being submitted to God. Now, somebody asked me, how can that be? How how does that work? Well, the spirit of God lives inside of me. I've received his spirit. And I'm assuming that you believe the spirit of God lives in you. Now, that's not two separate spirits. That is one spirit that lives in both of us. And so God can dwell in the heavens, and at the same time he's in the heavens, he can dwell in the man Christ Jesus. And that man's humanity and his mind and his will interacted with that divine spirit. That's how there is interaction. That's how there's dialogue. It is his humanity interacting with his divinity. 
Now, I can't take it a whole lot further than that because I don't know that anybody can fully describe it, but um, that is a far better alternative than two divine people having to wrestle and come to a conclusion. That means that the second divine person got it wrong. And omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence won't allow that. So so I'm not ignoring, we, oneness believers, are not ignoring dialogue. What we're saying is that there is one spirit, one God, who is father of all, he's above all, he's through all, and he's in you all. And there is that man, Christ Jesus, who was flesh. Now, that flesh died on the cross. There is a distinction there. We know that there's a distinction, but it's not a distinction of divine persons. It's a distinction of humanity and divinity. So did God die? No, the flesh died. The humanity died. But the Spirit of God cannot die. So the only distinction there, you know, he is, he is God in that that Spirit in Jesus was that same Spirit that dwells in all things and that dwells in the hearts of every believer. Right now, God is in, in millions of people right now. That's not a million different persons. That's one Spirit that fills all things. And he filled Jesus in a way that is unlike any other. He's the only begotten Son of God. So, so that is how he can be one person and yet still be the Father and the Son. Now, we don't have to uh, just assume that. The Bible actually says that would happen. If we read in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, this is a verse that oneness believers, they love. It's a beautiful illustration of how God would manifest himself in his redemptive work. And what the prophet said was this, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Okay, so the son, the child, will be born, he will be given, and he will also be the Everlasting Father. Now, how do you explain that? Well, that is a great mystery. It is a powerful mystery. But essentially what it means is that God would robe himself in flesh. And the only distinction between that God and that flesh is the humanity and the divinity. And that is where that dialogue comes from. If there's two divine people or three divine people jostling for control or figuring this thing out as they go, and one of them doesn't know some things, then, then we have a problem. But if we have an authentic human being, Jesus Christ, who is our substitute and who is a propitiation for us, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and he is filled with that one God, then it makes perfect sense. So I hope that answers your question. That is how dialogue between the Father and the Son works. Now, there's another question here. Um, the places where Jesus is directing people's attention away from himself and towards someone else in heaven, he says, I can't do anything of myself. It's the Father who does the works. Okay. Now, if you're looking at that through a lens, like there's three people, there's three divine persons, well, then that's that's the second divine person saying, now give glory to the first divine person. Um, and so you're you're pointing out Cody, that Jesus is saying that the Father is separate of himself. He does the works. He wouldn't be able to do this if he were only one. Well, that's not true. Jesus also said, my Father is greater than I. Whoa, wait. So we have a second divine person who is saying that there's a first divine person and that first divine person is greater. Now, that doesn't work because the Trinity teaches that they're co-eternal, they're consensual, and... So how does that work? And some of, some people throughout the ages have come up with ideas for this. One of the ideas is subordinationism, which was rejected as a heresy that, that the second divine person was subordinate to the Father or weaker than the Father. Well, logically, that had some problems. So they nipped and tucked and tweaked the doctrine of the Trinity. And when you say you believe the Trinity, which version of the Trinity do you believe? Is it the first version? Is it the second version or the finalized version that came about 400 years later? Because there's more than one version of the Trinity. So you, that's why we don't subscribe to it. Um, 
So when he says, I can't do anything of myself, it's the Father who does the works. What he's saying <clears throat> is that there's, the, and there's other things that you can point out that follow that same line of thought. There are certain things that, that the Father knows that Jesus doesn't know. You know, no man knows the day or the hour, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man. So there's things Jesus doesn't know. Does that mean there's a divine person that doesn't know these things? Well, how can he be equal then? How can he be coessential? What that is saying is that the Father, the Spirit, does the work and has all power and all authority. In his humanity, he can't. He can't do anything of himself. None of us can. Flesh cannot. The Spirit does the works, and when, when people went to glorify him, he was saying, do not glorify my flesh. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Um, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, my servants would fight for it. Jesus did not come to glorify the flesh. He came to crucify the flesh and to die as a substitute for us. And his humanity, he became the mediator. And the Bible makes a distinction between the administration of the Father and the Son in that. There's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, or the flesh, Christ Jesus. That humanity is the mediator. So God comes down in the form of a man. He robes himself in flesh like a man would put on a robe, except this was a actual, true, authentic human being. That had a will and had a mind, not a second divine person, but a genuine human being. <clears throat> and there's the dialogue. That humanity was um, less than the divine spirit. That divine spirit was greater than that humanity. That humanity did die. That spirit cannot die. That spirit does know all things. That Humanity does not know all things. In his humanity, he had several weaknesses, just like you do, just like I do. He got hungry as a human, but as a spirit, he said, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. Um, as, a, as a man, he sleeps in the boat, but as that divine spirit operating through that man, he calms the wind and the waves a short while later. He would operate from those different perspectives. Now, nobody else can do that. Jesus is one of a kind. Uh, it's why he, that he, in all things, he has preeminence, and it is a great mystery. But that is how that interaction takes place. That's how it can be one person, but yet it can still be dialogue between the Spirit of God and the humanity of God. Okay. Then, Cody, you ask this question. Um, God uses possessive language. My father, um, the father's son, a son cannot be his own father. A father, uh, nor can a father be his own son. It's a logical impossibility. Okay, that's a great point. Now, keep in mind Isaiah 9, 6, that he would be a child and a son, and he would still be the everlasting father. So before you say it's a logical impossibility, let me say this. It is a logical impossibility for you. It is a logical impossibility for me. I can't be in more than one place at one time. I can't be omnipresent or omniscient. But you can't put the restraints of a human on God. And so the Bible says that he would be the everlasting father and the son. It doesn't just say that. It says that he would be the root and he would be the branch. That means father and son. It says that he would be alpha and omega, beginning and end, first and last. The Bible uses these words to describe the, the multifaceted nature of God. So if you talk to an apostolic about this, they're going to tell you that he can be all of those things. He can be the shepherd, the lamb, the scapegoat, the door to the sheepfold. He can be the high priest. He can be, he can be all of that. He can be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So the scripture says this in Colossians chapter 2. 
Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, rudiments of the world, traditions of men. So we are subject to finitude. We are subject to spatial um, positioning. I can't be in more than one place at one time, but God can. He can fill all things at all times. And so he can be in heaven, he can be in me, he can be in you, he can be in various believers in a room at one time, but it's all one God who is doing that. He's above all, through all, and in you all. So to say it's a logical impossibility, you know, God is not biologically bound by these uh, descriptive terms. This, uh, when, when he's a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, these are the closest words we can come up with. He's not literally um, a biological father just like me. Um, father is his role in that he is a creative force who gives birth to all things. He's a son because he is born of a virgin, and he is born into this world. It's a reference to his humanity. He's a Holy Ghost because he's a spirit. Those are the closest words we have to come to it. But to try to limit him to those biological roles, because that's all we can do, is to limit God, and it's to become subject to the rudiments of the world and traditions of men. And the Bible says, beware of that. And let me give you an example of that. Um, you know, when you talk about uh, the Father coming, or, uh, or the Son coming to the Father, or or being sent into, okay, those are all wor- words to describe those roles in redemption. But be careful because God is omnipresent. He's omnipresent. And so the point of omnipresence is he's all places. You don't send anything to him in that sense. Nothing comes from him in a spatial dynamic. There is no such thing as space with God. God fills all space. And this is why Jesus, when it says he sits at the right hand of the Father, it doesn't mean, it's not talking about a location, it's talking about a place of power and authority. The Bible tells us what the arm of the Lord is. Um, The arm of the Lord is not a thing, the arm of the Lord is Jesus, Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? That means there's multiple reports. That means there's going to be multiple versions. And, And Isaiah was saying, there's only one you're supposed to believe. And then it says, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And then it goes on to say of Jesus that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And it it describes the arm of the Lord. So it's not biologically describing a literal arm. It It is God's way of using anthropomorphic language to describe how he works with mankind. So how do you find the right side of an omnipresent God? Omnipresence doesn't have a side, right, left, up, or down. God does not reach outside of himself or send anything to anywhere in the truest sense of who he is. God fills all things. And the Bible says in him we live and we move and we have our being. Nothing's done outside of God. We are in him. And we move and we have our being in him. So when it says that he is sent or he comes to, That's using language you can understand to describe the interaction of those redemptive roles in God. God's doing that to explain himself to you because those are the closest words you have in your vocabulary and my vocabulary. But omnipresence does not send or receive anything. It's always there at all times. And so that's how those words are used. That's how those he sent, he goes, he comes. All of those words are, are, are descriptive of how the interaction of that one God and those manifestations of that one God work to redeem us. It's not trying to describe how God moves around. <laughs> so I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, you asked the question about mediation between two members for reconciliation Um, now the Bible says that 
a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. So the man Christ Jesus, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, that is showing that that humanity served as a mediatorial, mediatorial role between the Spirit of God and fallen mankind. And so the authentic human being, Jesus Christ, in whom dwelled the one God, that one God, that humanity, was the, the mediator between fallen man and heaven, the Spirit of God. And there is a distinction between that humanity and that divinity, but it's not two divine people working together. Um, so a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one, the writer says. And he takes great pains to preserve that essential oneness, but yet show that the man Christ Jesus was a mediator in his humanity. So there is a distinction there, and we, we know that, but it's not of divine persons. All right, now here's a good one. This is one of my favorite ones. You mentioned that in John 17, Jesus prays that believers in him will be one just as he and the Father are one. If there's no second person within the Godhead to begin with, then we as believers cannot rightfully be one with God as Jesus is praying because then there would be two in one, which is contrary to this oneness belief. How is it that we believers can be included in the oneness with God and still be considered one, even though there's now two involved? Okay, so when he says that we would be one just as he and the Father are one, it's talking about in purpose. It's talking about in unity. God, the Spirit, and Jesus, the man, the man Christ Jesus, were not only one in terms of oneness, but they were also one in complete alignment. Jesus submitted his will. The man submitted his will to that spirit to preserve that unity. And he was saying, be one. I want these people to be unified with me, the man Christ Jesus, and the spirit of God. Just as we're in unity, let them be in unity as well. Now, if you're trying to say that we will be one just as God and the Father are one, then <laughs> that's a big, big problem because if you're trying to say that that's in terms of the Godhead and his essential being, then that means we can become part of the Godhead. That means there's going to be four, five, six, a thousand, a million persons in the Godhead. So we could never... Uh, join in into some kind of a polytheistic union as that would that would describe. So he's not talking about it being. He's talking about purpose and unity there because it is the only logical answer to that. So that is how we may be one even as we are one. Okay, with the idea of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God in heaven, you say it could seem to be a metaphor given the sim symbology in the Old Testament. Um, however, when Jesus used language like this, he would speak in parables, and he would say the kingdom of God is like, and you reference Acts chapter 7, and you say that Stephen is an actual eyewitness of Jesus at God's right hand. Okay, that to say that Stephen is an eyewitness and to try to say that well, he's actually there. There's actually two people up there, and I see him. Look, I'm looking at him. Well, John the Revelator was an eyewitness, and um, other people that saw into the heavenlies. Paul was an eyewitness and when he was caught up to the third heaven, um, but God still spoke in metaphors. He still spoke to mankind in a way that mankind could understand him to try to literally assert that that there are two people up there and Stephen was looking and that is what it is because you're just looking at it, is to miss the richness and the texture of the scripture. Many people saw into heaven and when they did, God spoke in symbols and signs. John the Revelator is the best example we have. He was caught up into the spirit on the Lord's day and he saw things. There's no greater eyewitness than that. But then he sees dragons and he sees 
multi-headed dragons. He sees um, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon is under her feet. And every bit of that is spiritual revelation being given to man in shadow and type and in symbol form. Um, the Bible says the Holy Ghost this signifying. And that word signify literally means signify. God spoke to man in signs, and he made things like unto. So the fact that Stephen sees that doesn't mean that this is a literal thing, that there's two people up there and one's big and one's sitting at a literal right hand. To, to try to say that means that there's, first of all, how do you see a spirit? Second of all, you know, um, that would ignore the richness of the other people that looked into heaven and God still spoke to them in the same way. So to literal, to hyper literalize that is to, is to superimpose a narrative on that the Bible doesn't support Jesus at the right hand of God is a, is a very powerful concept of the man being the doing, the reaching, the, the power of the place of power and it, he's described as being at the right hand in multiple locations. And how does a spirit have a hand? God is a spirit. The Father is a spirit. Does he have a hand? Does he have feet? Is there another body up there? Does the Holy Ghost have a body? Are they somehow finding room in a divine throne room? Are there three thrones in heaven? Does the Son have a throne? Does the Father have a throne in the middle and the Holy Ghost? Does he have a throne? Because if you take it to its logical conclusion, then there's got to be three thrones, one on the right hand, one on the left hand, and one in the middle. Now, that's hyper-literalization. That is, that is a very <clears throat> Greco-Roman idea. It is a very pagan idea. That's the danger of the, of the Roman Catholic ideology that's been handed down to us. Um, the Hebrews did not look at it that way. The arm of the Lord was Jesus, and he was, an, he was the extension of the Spirit. He was the visible manifestation of the invisible God, the express image of his person, not persons. And so he is the image of God, and he is at the right hand in the sense of power, authority, but an omnipresent Spirit who fills all things doesn't have a right side, and a Spirit doesn't have a hand. And so it's not that it's just a metaphor, it is the symbology of the scripture that translates God's nature to us in a way we can understand. So oneness does not go against New Testament ideology. Trinitarian dogma does. It's not in the Bible. That word is not there. The, the concept is not supported. The greatest revelation in the entire Bible, the greatest commandment is Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Um, so that is the perspective of oneness believers. It's a battle that has raged for many, many, many years. Um, probably one of our favorite ways of showing that one God is found in the Great Commission when Jesus tells his disciples to go into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that's found in Matthew 28. If you read Luke 24, he says that repentance and remission of sins would be preached in his name. He said, in my name. That is Luke's perspective on the Great Commission. It's the same moment, and Luke wrote what he heard. Remission of sins would be preached in my name. And then Luke said in Acts 2.38 that we are baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. When Mark says it, he said that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. So when you get to Acts, Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19, Romans chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 1, 
Galatians 3, 27. When you get to these verses, every one of them, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. To take that further, the history record distinctly shows that the early church baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And so when you take all those verses and you surround Matthew 28, 19 with them, the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is Jesus, Jehovah, salvation. The name that is above every name. And that takes us to Acts 4.12. There's salvation in no other name than the name of Jesus. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So that name is the name of the one true God who reveals himself as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And because there's dialogue between the humanity of God, the mind of that man submitted itself to the mind of the Spirit, that's the reason for the dialogue. That's the right hand of God. And that's how it can be one person that manifests himself in multiple ways. So I hope that helps you, Cody. I, I thank you for taking the time. I, I, I enjoyed it. I look forward to your response. I'd love to hear back from you. I hope that makes sense. I know sometimes it's so hard to understand an eternal God. How can the finite understand the infinite? How can, how can fallen man understand the eternal? I submit to you that if you will throw away the last 2,000 years and all of the commentary and all of the flawed assumptions that have permeated Roman Catholicism and the denominalism that came from it, and before you say we can't do that, we did that. Protestantism did that. They threw out infant baptisms. They threw out sprinkling. Many of them did. They threw out confessionals. They, flew, they threw out the priesthood. They threw out salvation by works alone. They threw out a lot of things. And I submit that they need to throw out the Trinity. If they did, they would find out that the default position is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity to dialogue. And for all of our Trinitarian friends out there, um, we hope that you'll engage. We, we pray for you. Um, I don't think that we're all that far apart. Essentially, if you think there's one throne in heaven, we pretty much believe the same thing. We just don't use the word Trinity, and we won't use the word persons because none of it's in the Bible. Thank you for an opportunity to dialogue. And for those of you that are, that are joining us, God bless you. I hope this is a strength to you. I hope you can share it with your friends. I look forward to speaking with you. I look forward to further conversations in the future. God bless you. We'll see you next time.